Happy Comic Con International weekend, my friends. I'm Adam Steiger, the director of Fang. And I'm Gregory Blair, uh, one of the actors from Fang. And who do you play, Mr. Gregory Blair? Uh, I play a character, Harold Pinter. He is the caretaker for the Crowleys. I don't often direct films that, you know, you stay on the property. I mean, that was a big challenge altogether. But did that in any way help, like, give you character? I mean, did you ever experience a role like that before where you've done something like that? I have stayed at a location before, and I think it always helps. For me, I think it always helps. I love sort of um, being in the space, and uh, you kind of live it and breathe it. I think, for me, I find that very beneficial. I love it. I can distinctly remember you had a prosthetic on your forehead, and it just, like, stayed there the entire week after we shot that segment. It just kind of stayed there. Phil, Phil Beath, who did the makeup um, on both that and them, uh, he he does he does really good makeup. He he makes sure that it's not going to be problematic on set, like a piece isn't going to fall off or anything. So that thing was stuck on really really well. And even though I took a shower, it was still there. So it just stayed there. Let's talk about the hours because the the film, like when your segments, we shot five days um, in this house, uh, on a location, and then we shot another five days sporadically where you were not part of the project anymore. You were done right. and wrapped everything. In, in the moment, the hours, they don't, I, for me, I, they don't exactly matter. Have you, did you ever think that, I mean, we have a couple more fel- festivals. Unfortunately, COVID kind of slowed everything down, but we have like 11 more festivals that we've submitted the film to. Uh, the first set of uh, submissions, we won 10 awards. And you won, what, Best Actor? Every actor hopes that that their performance will somehow connect and resonate with people. I mean, that's that's why we do what we do, is to connect to other people and move them in some way, make them laugh, make them cry, make them scream, whatever. Um, so that's always satisfying, yeah. I mean, you know, who, who wouldn't enjoy getting feedback that people say, ooh, I love that guy, ooh, I hate that guy, or whatever. When you go into a film, you don't ever think it's going to win anything. I mean, you just make a film to make a film. And then you start seeing people really starting to like it. There's people out there that really like the grunge element. And there's some people that can't stomach the grunge. I mean, because there's a couple, I mean, the opening scene. I mean, the opening scene, you see, you see a little more than you probably want to see in an opening scene of a film. You know what I mean? Um, I totally know what you mean. I remember the first time I watched it, I was like, Ugh. And that was, the, the opening scene has uh, actor, uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Burns Jr. He sits in this chair. He kind of gives us a little foreshadow of what's to come. And that was not in the script where um, he opens the movie. Remember? I don't remember exactly yeah, what, uh, yeah. what it was, but he wasn't the original opener. No. When we were editing it, I said, uh, we need something to shock and grab the attention like instantly. And, um, and that definitely does it. I definitely think that it made its impact. Um, I was actually reading a review uh, recently. Um, I did not know this one existed. It's about, I don't know, maybe six or seven months old. Is Roy Crowley a vampire? I don't know if you saw this article. Oh, I did see that. Never, Never have I seen that article before. And this person took the time to write this article to try to convince us that this character was a vampire. And... Mm-hmm. Let's just kind of talk about it for a second, because the original first draft of the script was supposed to be Roy Crowley was a vampire, and Mm. Doris Crowley was a werewolf. So it was supposed to be that structure. And then as the time as the film like grew, we kind of started morphing it more to get away from uh, recognizing which character it really really was, and kind of just lumped it all up. Which leads me to this question. What do you think Harold is? Because we've had talks. What do you think Harold is? Well, I think that that's one of the interesting things about the film is uh, all of the characters that seem to be something other than or more than human aren't 100% definable. I mean, even if you look at Doris as a werewolf, she's a 
strange kind of werewolf. Um, you know, she doesn't operate in the way that werewolves usually do in your typical movie. And Roy, uh, whatever he is, he doesn't. He certainly doesn't operate exactly as a vampire entirely. Um, but he doesn't seem to have werewolf um, elements exactly. And Harold falls into the same category of that sort of mysterious, what is Harold? Because as you watch the movie, you start, you, you realize that, okay, uh, he certainly appears to be human, but then he seems to also not be quite as... Um, susceptible to injury as a normal human. Uh, and then in one scene, he seems to have uh, strength that is far beyond a normal human. So he, and, and those are the only, uh, what's the word I want? Those are the only sort of superhuman uh, traits that you see in that particular film, but they don't tell you what Harold is. And I guess um, uh, I'm hoping that will discover some more traits. We have an idea. I think it's a pretty solid idea, but I think um, it will be a prequel versus a sequel. Oh, okay. And uh, we'll see how that goes. But we have uh, the myself, I'm writing it with my wife, Kristen Steigert. And um, we have this very unique structure about it. So if it comes to fruition and it ends up becoming a script, I'm hoping that it does. And I'm hoping we'll see Harold again, maybe someday. Um, in the future. What, what was it like to you? Because I can tell you how I felt, uh, but I don't know if I've ever actually asked you, what was it like to shoot that dining room scene? Because you only have a very, you have a very small segment in it. And then, yeah. but you were there the entire time. I remember you watching the scene off camera. And uh, I'm just kind of curious to know what your experience of that was in person, because it's such a grotesque scene, thanks to Melantha Blackthorn and uh, Patrick Millette, who played the Crowleys. Because they both so um, completely and enthusiastically got into it, uh, which was thrilling to watch. Um, the uh, What I remember about that particular scene is um, the first time that they shot the, the eating part of it, um, you know, they brought out this, this the, the quote unquote food, <laughs> uh, which was pretty gross looking. I think it was uh, all potatoes and, in a sauce, if I'm not mistaken, like the potatoes. Yeah, I know. I think it was most of it because uh, Melantha was vegan, so it right. couldn't be meat, but it was supposed to look like meat, and it looked like meat. Yeah. And um, and that you know, you know, I I don't remember if a bell goes off or whatever happens that they just dive in and it was so sudden and they were both so completely into it and their faces in the plates and the sounds and everything. I was just kind of gobsmacked. And, and then when she looks up and there's all that food on her face and in her hair and she starts talking with the food in her mouth and it falls out of her. I'm sorry. I totally cracked up. You know, it's a very, uh, it's a very, like, if we're talking about the film, the film has a couple iconic scenes. I feel like that one is meet the family. Here it is. It's in your face. Like the camera pans into the actors. Um, totally. And, and it's very like, we shot it on a Sigma. So the picture looks, it's very narrow, but it's wide. So what ends up happening is the camera kind of distorts even the picture a slight so that it makes you like really look close up and it's like in your face so there's that scene that scene i think i heard more i want to say compliments but grotesque type compliments Many i remember i read one review uh, at one point i try not to read reviews but one review was like i couldn't get past that scene <laughs> and i was like adam's probably giggling about that <laughs> but you know what the film was made for hardcore horror fans people that right. like like the the saw films the hostile films those type of style of films the in your face i you're gonna push it don't show me it but you're gonna show me oh you showed me it Ugh. you know those types of moments in film and uh i think cinema as of late has gotten away from those style of grotesque film i'm sure they're out there i'm not saying they're uh, but mainstream film 
isn't like doing the saw type story arcs anymore with the grotesque violence. There's always interest in werewolves. And then if you add in this, this grotesque element of the werewolves, you know, like it's a den of wolves, the whole house is just like, I mean, it's such a unique story too, because at any point up till 10 o'clock, the lead characters could leave the building. They could leave, but, but they all think they all are in this like trance in a sense where they just can't leave because they don't want to be rude. They want to be politically correct, kind of wear it all out and see where it goes. And um, I think it's just so unique. Well, the whole film is, I think, full of these um, just strange choices um, that keep the audience questioning. Because it's kind of, I, think, I kind of think of the house as a, as a fun house. In Very the much. sense that you never how how the house is connected, how the rooms are connected, how all those doors lock and unlock, and the and the security system is on and then it's off, and it's everything is like there just to mess with you in a way, and not just mess with the people that are in the house, you know, the guests, but the audience. Yeah. Well, you wrote these really sort of strong, uh, very uh, colorful characters. We got to talk about the the elephant in the room. Unfortunately, in this project, we've had two two actors pass away. Uh. You know, and recently, uh, the late Michael O'Hear, who plays a role in the Riverview Monsters too, a continuation of his character in this film itself. Can you talk a little bit about working? Because I know you didn't work with Leora, unfortunately, but you did work with no. Michael. Can you talk about any of that? I just remember his um, his focus and his drive and his desire to do the best that he could do because I think he was struggling at that time uh, having uh, either he had just come out of the hospital recently or something I can't remember so I know he was struggling with his health while we were shooting and you know it was late nights and it was cold and it was long and it was hard and you know for somebody in perfect health uh, that's a challenge. And so you know, that was the one thing that I remember is um, uh, the, the, the empath in me being concerned for him uh, and then the, the artist, the professional in me being so impressed with him forging ahead like that and, and, giving, and giving his all. If you look at Gore, which was the first film that me and him worked on, it was very... Uh, character driven but Michael embraced that character and as far as I can remember Michael would tell me that he absolutely loved the character and if I would always write a role for him as that character he would always play it no matter what he would never never reject the role and uh, I said well that was pretty impressive so after we wrapped on gore I actually wrote a film that did not work out which was a werewolf film it just got too expensive and I wanted more creature looks or creature effects and stuff. And I, I just couldn't pull it off. I was too early on in my career and whatever. So we, we shelved that. But the next film that I was going to make was a werewolf film with Michael here. But then we don't see Michael's character again until later in my career in a film called Star. And basically, he does a cameo appearance referencing the Gore character and, and things. You know, you watch uh, a film called The Grim Becoming. There's huge connection pieces to Fang to A Grim Becoming. There's huge connection pieces to the Ripping Eel Monster to A Grim Becoming. And they all kind of revolve around William Sanders, the detective that has grown in these stories. So to, to, to lose a man of his caliber, his talent, his uh, friendship, uh, just him in general, bouncing ideas off of him, it's a very... He, the man was almost like, uh, I want to say, he was a mentor, yes, but I want to say he was more like um, a very close family friend. Uh, the man would come to my house on, you know, holidays and stuff like that. So to lose him is very sad, very sad. But uh, to get back to what you were saying, um, I think he had been struggling during that time. Um, but he was somebody that would never show it because he didn't want his crap. He didn't want the opportunity to be missed. I mean, all those things. Uh, Leonora's performance in Fang is terrific, and what a nice last hurrah in a way. I would agree. Um, Leora, 
originally didn't have like the character Leora plays in the film almost had no lines originally. I think she had one line, and it was so so silly. It was a stupid throwaway line, you know. And when I knew we had Leora's attention to do the film, Kristen and I went back and talked, and I said, "Is there anything we could do more for her?" And she said, "Well, why don't I write this whole sub story?" and became that long monologue speech that she does so perfectly in the film. So, you know, sometimes you get this, it's all about the right casting. You get the right character or the right actor, and the next thing you know, the film has changed. Like, we're talking about Harold Pinter right now. Just like Leora's character, uh, Carol, uh, Carol Eve, it's just a whole thing of change. So, I'm glad I had a chance to work with her, too. Um, and I uh, just want to remind you guys, obviously, September 15th, we're going to be on iTunes, Voodoo, and Google Play. You can see us now on Vimeo and Amazon Prime or Amazon in general. You can rent it, buy it, whatever you'd like to do. Dare you enter my house without permission? Maybe we should just wait outside. Shouldn't be alone in this neck of the woods. A person could disappear out here. Never could reach him. Years ago, when our town folded up, the mayor sold a lot of the town's property off. Mr. Crowley used his riches to save what was left of the town. In doing so, don't want to go in. 